My name is Claire Richards. I'm the series director of Scouting for Girls, Fashion's Darkest Secrets. Sure. Um, I'm Lucy Osborne. Um, I'm the uh, producer of Scouting for Girls um, and an investigative journalist for The Guardian. I'm Carrie Otis, and I am a mother, author, model, and activist. And so grateful to be partaking in this docu-series. When I was told that I was going to go stay with the boss of the agency, I actually thought that that was a good sign. After that initial rape by Gerald Murray, I would endure continuing um, assault. The dissociation that took place there was a separation from myself just to survive. And when I continued to work after that, I mean, you know the face. I knew the face that was expected of me. This is Factual America. We're brought to you by Alamo Pictures, an Austin and London-based production company making documentaries about America for international audiences. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. This week, it is my pleasure to welcome Claire Richards, Lucy Osborne, and Carrie Otis. Their docuseries, Scouting for Girls, Fashion's Darkest Secrets, reveals how a group of men behind the world's most successful modeling agencies were involved in a darker side of the industry. It exposes how modeling agents like John Casablancas, Jean-Luc Brunel, Claude Haddad, and Gerald Marie, who denies the allegations, created a culture that enabled many of them to indulge in a spectrum of abusive behaviors, ranging from grooming and coercion to the rape of models as young as 15. The film hears from a generation of forgotten women who were promised stardom and glamour, but instead found themselves used, abused, and in some cases, trafficked between networks of powerful men. Building on an ongoing investigation by Lucy for The Guardian, the series delivers the fashion industry its own Me Too reckoning and follows the survivors, including Carrie, as they come together to take action against those responsible. I'm here with Claire Richards, series director, Lucy Osborne, senior producer, and Carrie Otis, model, author, wellness consultant, and activist, and contributor to the film. The film is Scouting for Girls, Fashion's Darkest Secrets. It's coming to Sky Documentaries on June 24th. Uh, Claire, may we start with you? What, what is Scouting for Girls all about? Well, Scouting for Girls is a three-part documentary series that looks at the darker side of the fashion industry. It, it spans, you know, three decades. It starts in the 80s and brings that brings us right up to present day to look at the way in which agents of very well-known agencies were promising um, teenagers, girls, the, 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 sort of the expectation of, of lucrative careers in, in, in fashion, which, which, which did, some, did sometimes happen, but there was also this really dark underbelly that led to um, grooming, coercion and rape, um, that, that went on and on and on, um, pretty much in plain sight. Okay, and then this is, uh, if, if I understand correctly, um, this is, uh, much of it's largely based on investigations for the uh, Guardian that you've, you've done, Lucy, is that, is that correct? Yeah, so um, it, it sort of started, I, I um, back in 2020, I wrote a series of articles for The Guardian um, on um, sexual abuse in the fashion industry. Um, and so it sort of evolved from there. Um, Wonderhood Studios, who um, produced this, were also sort of looking into a similar area. So Sky sort of paired, paired The Guardian, mm. from The Guardian up with Wonderhood, and we, uh, yeah, we made the, the series together. Okay, and in those investigations, I mean, and I highly recommend. Uh, we'll have links uh, in the show notes to the to the Guardian, uh, the the UK uh, based uh, newspaper. But uh, I mean, broadly, what did we, I mean? It was was it like peeling an onion? The more you looked, the more you found, and uh, sort of. I mean, I think Claire's kind of alluded to it, uh, not more than alluded to it, certainly. But what what were you finding uh, as you were investigating? 
Well, I mean, it sort of started for me about four years ago. I was um, at the BBC making, I made a film on um, on Weinstein and then Trump and and mm. speaking to obviously a lot of his um, survivors of their, of, of, of their alleged sexual misconduct. And um, it just, the more, the more people I spoke to, the more I realized that, you know, that, that not only were, was there a problem with uh, models that were being sent to the likes of people like Trump and Weinstein, there was also, um, uh, p- agents' names kept coming up, so people like mm. Gerald Marie and uh, Jean Luc Brunel, who um, were allegedly, you know, sending um, models to um, to other to men outside the fashion industry, but who were also um, sexually assaulting and raping models themselves as well. Um, so it sort of just sort of kept growing really from there. Um, and then in 2020, I started working with The Guardian and um, wrote the series of articles. Um, and, and once I sort of started doing that, it really just uh, blew up <laughs> in terms of, you know, mm. the, I was just being contacted by model after model who had experienced this. Um, and it just um, became clear that this was a, you know, huge, a huge issue within the fashion industry mm-hmm. um, over many, many decades. Um, so um, yeah, I, I think, I think Carrie, I think I first connected with Carrie. Um, I think I was looking at, it was right at the beginning when I was first looking into Trump. And I think someone sort of said, you know, speak to Carrie Otis. She's obviously, um, you know, one of the first people that really sort of started speaking out about this. Um, long before the, the the Me Too movement happened. Mm. Um, and I think initially I just sort of asked her about Trump <laughs> and then obviously started speaking to her about her own experiences more broadly than that. Um, and um, yeah, so it just sort of, it all, all sort of evolved from, from there. Hmm. Well, that's uh, exactly. And Carrie, I mean, as, as, as uh, Lucy has said, you've been going public with your story for, for a while. It definitely predates... Uh, uh, before anyone had heard of hashtag, long, let alone uh, Me Too. Um, so you had this 2011 memoir, and that's when I think is that is that the first time you made you publicly made these? Uh, you, you shared your story, and maybe if you don't mind, I, I, I hate to make you relive these these uh, things, memories, but uh, maybe you can tell us what's what happened to you, and uh, and, and what you've been sharing with 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 those uh, with with audiences. Yeah, I decided to write my memoir in 2011, Beauty Disrupted, and it really was in and around the fact that I was a mother to two little girls. Mm. And it felt it is my my duty, my responsibility to work so that my daughters and others, other young people don't have to normalize sexual harassment and sexual abuse anywhere and certainly not in the workplace. And Mm. Through that process, I really realized how much I had normalized um, just to just mm. to sort of survive what I had been through in the industry. Um, I was a minor. I was 17 when I was trafficked from San Francisco to New York and from New York to Paris, France. Um, I was told that I was going to get to go stay at the boss's apartment. And in my vulnerability and naivety and having just dropped into this whole new world where I was in over my head. Um, I thought that it was actually a good thing. I thought I was actually sort of a chosen one and that it was hopeful that I, I was going to go stay in the apartment of Gerald Marie. Um, I got there and it turned out he became my perpetrator for quite some time. And, and it was also made very clear to me during that time that Um, If I protested and there was nowhere really to protest or if I protested that the person that held the power and the cards in my life at that time. So, you know, from from finances, my passport was withheld, um, roof over my head, food, metro, all of it that I simply wouldn't work. So that was made very clear to me. Um, And it was really the beginning of tremendous dissociation and traumatization and compartmentalization that, you know, I, um, um, that, that I sort of created just as a survival for, for my experiences of that time. Mm. And um, I mean, I mean, this is, you know, this is what's happened must have, uh, it's had an incredible effect on your life, hasn't it? I mean, is it? Uh, I mean, I mean, you've you've gotten through it, uh, 
but maybe you can tell us more about how, I mean, like you said, maybe you didn't even realize at the time what, uh, I think that what happens in the, in the doc, a lot of the people we, you, they're interviewed don't even realize until later what they've actually been through you know, the, the women in the, in the, that are interviewed, the subjects, and uh, maybe you can maybe give us a little more insights into, into that. Yeah. I, you know, like so many trauma survivors, um, that's what we do is dissociate just to be yeah. able to survive and, and function. And I had a interviewer recently say, you were, you were so strong, you were so courageous. And I'm like, no, I was none of those things. Mm. Actually, I couldn't even speak of what was happening in my life. There was so much shame and fear around what was transpiring. And it has certainly taken me many, many years to heal from those traumas, um, working with, you know, I'm, I'm privileged and I have mm. resources and unlike so many, you know, there's so many women and men who don't have the resources that I've had access to. So I'm incredibly grateful that I've been able to embark on a healing journey and that healing journey mm. continues. And it definitely yeah. has been part of working on this docu-series. Like we've been held so incredibly by Sky and Wonderhood and the Guardian you know, with this team of women um, that have helped create the safety net for us to walk through and share our stories and and have it be so um, respected and and taken care of and and the stories told in such um, an honoring, tender way. And I think many of us mm. survivors have w gone through periods with the press where you know our stories have tried to be sensationalized and and yeah. pulled apart, and it's been a painful process. So this has actually been an incredible reckoning to be able to tell our stories in this way and this platform and be held so well. Okay. I mean, I mean, to follow up on that, I think that's, uh, uh, I guess there's two things I think of, but Lucy, I guess what you found is that uh, Carrie's story, unfortunately, is not un that unusual, is it? Sadly, no, um, no. I mean, and just to follow up on what what Carrie was saying, I think what what makes this um, docu series different to other um, documentaries that cover um, Me Too allegations, mm -hmm. um, we, we, you get to see the um, the, the the survivors um, mm -hmm. obviously re reliving and talking about their. Um, their experiences in the past, but you also sort of are able to, we, we follow their journeys the, the whole way through to, to today. So you really do mm. get a sense of the impact that that has over time and, and how um, the, the, the personal journeys, you see Carrie's personal journey and the other women, um, you know, coming to terms with, with what happened to them and to, to the present day where they're, they're seeking justice for what happened. Um, mm. So I think that that really sort of sets it apart from other documentaries on this sort of subject. Um, and it's really, it's sort of empowering and it's, it's amazing to sort of see that, that journey and get a sense of really, you know, how, how courageous it is for, for, for women to talk about these things. Mm. Um, and um and, and and how difficult it is. Um, I think that sometimes you, you don't get you don't get to see that that kind of progression. Um, you know, you just sort of read about their story in the press or or hear about it. Um, but you don't it's it's difficult to convey maybe that that how hard that is. Um, mm. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the series, it tells the story of, um, of, of four women. So it's so a Carrie and, and three others um, uh, in, in a lot of detail. Um, uh, but obviously their experiences are representative of a much, much bigger problem uh, that was happening to, to so many models at the same time. And I think, you know, uh, the reason I started looking into this um, was because I just... I was so taken aback by the scale of it. It was literally every model I spoke to, pretty much every model I spoke to had an, their own experience. Um, but if they mm. didn't, they were connecting me with, you know, mm. handfuls of other models who had. Um, and so it just, um, it just felt like this, I was sort of like, well, you know, why hasn't this been a huge story before? Um, and obviously there, there were several attempts in the past to, to you know, to, 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 to shine a light on this and, you know, in some cases, you know, very detailed, very good investigations, but for whatever reason, mm. um, things moved on and people forgot about it. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, 
uh, my investigation, my, my work in the Guardian um, has has covered some of it, but there's there's many many more women who have had similar experiences, and and actually Marianne Shine, who is one of the four women in the series, mm. um, she she came forward to me after one of the Guardian articles, so she actually got in touch, um, okay. and she sort of. Um, she was sort of, as a lot of women have told me, they they feel they felt for many years, decades, sometimes that they were the only ones to experience this because I think the models, Carrie could probably talk about this um, best than I can, but there was a sort of um, models didn't talk to each other about these things. There was a lot of shame, as Carrie said. You know, so it's only in recent years for some people reading these accounts from other women mm. that they've realized that this is a much bigger thing that they were a part of and that they weren't alone uh so we we get a sense of that journey from marianne in the film as well yeah i think i have to say too yes lucy completely and when i wrote my book you know here i was coming out with mm. all of this information and nobody wanted to touch it i mean i think so much of this is timing nobody wanted to have the conversations and I too felt like, I didn't think I was a standalone situation, but I had no idea, you know, fast forward to now, how mm. many women and how prevalent, how pervasive this was within the industry. Hmm. And I, I actually want to pick up more on that in a, in a minute, but I, I to pick up also what you said, something you said earlier, Carrie, and also you, Lucy, I mean, this, about this, um, this, these forces all coming together with the the Guardian and the survivors and you, Claire, and, and making the uh, the series. I mean, how do you? Um, I, I mean, you've mentioned how you got involved, but how you know how do you? Uh, I mean, it must be quite challenging, isn't isn't it, to do this? Obviously, not obviously going to be sympathetic, but in a way that I mean, you're making people, you're making uh, the survivors live this again, and it it must. Uh, how has that been? I mean, that must be a very challenge, you know, challenging. It's done extremely well as someone who's seen the series. Uh, for, I've had the fortune to see the series already. Uh, but how did you how did you manage that? Because that's that's got to be you know very difficult. Yeah, well, it, it definitely was a real worry, you know, at the very beginning when I, I was reading all the accounts and yeah. understanding the level of abuse and really digesting it in a way that, um, because, you know, as, as you said, it's sort of, it is deeply disturbing. Um, and the, the good thing about me too is obviously that we are talking about these things more and more and more and that that has created a space for these stories to be told but it there was as a, there were challenges a in a storytelling kind of way was that we needed to we needed the the the, the models to be able to feel like they could tell their stories in a, in a safe way but that that wasn't going to be re-traumatizing and mm. that it wasn't going to feel too familiar to an audience who is now accustomed yeah. to hearing some of this. Right. Um, so that was um, that that was really challenging. But you know the, the 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 way that we you know wanted to try and overcome that was to make sure that we understood um, you know Carrie's we understood who Carrie was as a seventeen year old. We understood mm. a 15, 16 year old. You know what was it like to feel the things about the modeling industry that anybody who has the has a dream can relate yeah. to and that if you understood if you understood that then you would be with mm. with the stories with the women as they were telling you it and that therefore we were creating a bond with the viewer that would make them want to get mm. to the end if that okay. makes sense well uh, i I, yes, it does make sense, and I think you've achieved, yeah, more than have, have achieved that. So, uh, uh, so I, I do appreciate that. I mean, Carrie, you were saying, uh, you know, you hadn't realized how, how you know, there is this feeling that you may be the only one in or one of the few, and then you find it's much more prevalent. I mean, are these issues, I know, you, you know how, is, how prevalent are these issues still today? Because, you know, you know, a lot of this is discussing the 80s and 90s, but as Claire's brought it mentioned, we bring it. You bring it forward to present day, and we'll talk more about what's happening present day. But in terms of the industry, is this uh, um, how prevalent? As as well as far as you know, how prevalent is this still today? 
Yeah, so I'm still active in the industry. I am on the board of the Model Alliance, an incredible organization, and we have a support line. And the calls that come into that support line indicate that these issues are still ongoing today. Uh, if you consider this is an industry that is still largely unregulated, working with the most vulnerable workforce, which is minors or mm -hmm. young adults, um, that we don't have a regulatory body and a system in place to protect its workforce is outrageous. It's unacceptable. So it is my understanding from financial transparency to the normalization of sexual harassment to objectification, all very alive and well in this industry. I think that's a, a good point to, to um, maybe take a, a break for our, our listeners. Uh, we'll be right back with Claire Richards, Lucy Osborne, and Carrie Otis. The film is docu-series, actually, is Scouting for Girls, Fashion's Darkest Secrets, coming to Sky Documentaries on June 24th. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. That's why being here in France and testifying to the French police with these women is so meaningful. Naming him sends a signal to other women who may be suffering that you're not alone and we are here for you. We're doing this in support of other survivors and also an invitation for anyone who is within the statute of limitations. Please join us, we're here for you. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with award-winning director Claire Richards, award-winning investigative journalist Lucy Osborne, and fashion model, author, wellness consultant, and activist Carrie Otis. The film is Scouting for Girls, Fashion's Darkest Secrets. It's a three-parter, and it's coming to Sky Documentaries on June 24th. Um, I mean, one thing we were talking about before the break um, is that, um, you know, really what, I mean, there's... There's obviously this 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 abuse and and harassment that uh, that you know you've you've documented and and um, these these survivors have have had to live through. But one thing that struck me the most, maybe it's as a father of a daughter, and I don't know, but it's the footage of the time that you you've you that I think it was the one of the look of the year. Um, um, what was considered, I think, one of the early days of uh, of reality TV. But I just you know, and I lived through that period. I found it absolutely shocking, those, those, <laughs> that footage. Because uh, we are talking about, we're not just, it, there's no excuse regardless of what age we're talking about, but we are talking about 14, 15 year old girls, aren't we? I mean, yeah, it, it is shocking. I, when I remember first looking at, at that, fo that footage, and I, you know, that, that wasn't that, it didn't feel like it was that long ago. But actually, yeah. when you look back at it, it makes you feel like it was a long, long time ago because there has been, you know, even though a lot of this behaviour still, still still exists, there has been quite a lot of cultural change around the way we behave towards towards women, for example. But yeah, so you do you do. It was shocking um, to look through it, and 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 it was a great find, Lucy, wasn't it? When um, to have to have found Roberto, who was the behind the scenes cameraman at the Look of the Year competitions, oh, who wow. um, was able to 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 give us access to that footage because it's it is shocking looking back. Yes, I mean maybe you tell us a little bit more about that because that's quite. I mean, I hate to put it this way, but that's quite a find to be able to, because uh, that's that's not something that's probably a lot of those people thought would see the light of day again. Well, I mean, Lucy, you 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 step in here, but I I understand it. Roberto, Lucy found Roberto, um, yeah. you know, as part of the investigation, and and then discovered that there was this footage, but he hadn't wanted to release up until now because he didn't feel the time was right. Is that that's right, Lucy? Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, um, I mean, he, he's um, he's he's a very he's a successful uh, photographer, fashion photographer, mm. um, and he has you know he's he's photographed 
you know, the world's top supermodels and yeah. he has uh, boxes and boxes of, of uh, photographs and footage. Um, I think initially, I think he had some stills from Look of the Year a few years ago when I mm. first spoke to him. And, um, and then he said, I think I, I think I have some, um, some footage as well somewhere. And then eventually he sort of found a few bits of it in his boxes. And then I think it was in 20, 2020 or 2019 when I was in New York for The Guardian and I went to his flat, his apartment, and, um, and we just went through them all. And he found this whole box of the footage. Um, so it was amazing to obviously to, to find that and to go through it. Um, but there's there's more, I think, as well. So it would, it, you know, we're, we're just, just still hoping that Roberto is going to get his hands on the last few wow. tapes. Yeah. I mean, is it it was it was it events like that that made you think this could be a docu series? Is that or were you or did that kind of once you when did you think when did this happen? This pairing up and the, deciding this actually is let's turn this more from just investigative journalism pieces and turn it into a into a series well I mean it was um I think for, for me personally I, I I think as soon as I started just having all these hearing all these experiences from so many models I mean you know literally dozens and dozens um I, I sort of really felt that there was it's, it's more than you can do even even with the long work hat that I was lucky to have at the Guardian you know that there's there's you just can't even touch the surface really um so I, I, I really felt that it was something that that needed to be told on mm. screen as well um but um but it was sort of a it sort of evolved from there i mean it was um the guardian were keen to do something um and and yeah eventually we were you know we were so we were sort of trying to look into how we could make it whether we mm. you know, this could be a sort of single or a, a series and then um spoke to sky who were already in touch with wonderhood who had kind of had the same sort of idea that this mm. was some, the story that really still needed to be told um, and hadn't been told properly before. Um, so yeah, it, it was, um, it kind of evolved, yeah, all evolved from, from, from that. Um, but I mean, it was, you know, I think, um, and Carrie can probably talk this a bit better than I can, but I, I think that there's a feeling maybe among, there's a certainly a decent, people are sort of desensitized to me, to, to me too uh, issues. Um, uh, and also I think particularly with the modeling industry, I think, um, people sort of feel like they already know about it or um, are maybe less sympathetic, unfortunately, towards models. Um, and I think that so, it, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a some an idea that instantly got picked up you know it, it was um so, so you know it's obviously great that, that sky realized that this is an important issue and and wanted to do something mm. um but it wasn't it wasn't um something that just suddenly happened uh, straight after the articles and do you think is that fair, Carrie? What Lucy's just said? Yeah, absolutely. And and part of the conversation is there's sort of a stigma or perspective of the modeling industry that it's incredibly glamorous and that we're incredibly privileged and that mm -hmm. you know models are are beautiful people that have you know they get paid a ton of money and and for some reason that creates a discrimination against us that we shouldn't have the same rights and protections as other workers in other industries. Yeah. Um, and I agree the desensitization within this industry and within our cultures, but also the normalization of these behaviors within the industry, you know, um, are very real and even applauded as you can see in some of that mm. footage, you know, you see these powerful men together that are yeah. acting unbelievably despicable and they're just, cheering each other on. And that was also that generation. And I think part of the conversation that's happening now is, you know, there are women that are coming together in this mm -hmm. wave and, and it is about timing and in this explosion yeah. of like, okay, you may have grown up that way, but I am no longer going to stand by complicit or enable toxic mm -hmm. masculinity to be prevalent and running, running the world. Um, yes. though I think that that's part of sort of this movement of what's happening is enough is enough. Yeah. Well, it will indeed. I mean, um, I mean, I guess one thing I want to get back to is actually, uh, Lucy, you're saying, cause I, I want to hold that thought as well about the timing and, and what's happening now. Cause I think that's as, as, as important as everything that's been documented in the, in the, in the in the series but i mean you you did allude to this uh there was a 60 minutes piece by diane sawyer in the 80s there's a bbc piece in 99 i believe 
that neither one are, are for whatever reason can see the light of day these these days i mean what we've been here before so what is uh i think you say you're not sure why those things were what's caused those uh series not to resonate or not to be able to be uh uh, uh repeated on on air but uh and uh but I guess you've also had to get everything just you're you've had to have this all just airtight, haven't you, to in order to make sure that this does get seen and and more than just once. Is mm. that fair enough, Lucy? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean definitely um with with, with the, the the Gerald Marie article that I did, yeah. um I think there were eight eight women um that that spoke to me for that obviously Carrie had already told her story in her um her book um and a couple of the other women in there had also um at least tried to tell their story publicly um and um but we needed you know the, the Guardian we, we, we wanted to have as many women's voices as possible to show that there was a you know a pattern of behavior um that these these women didn't know each other didn't know of each other's mm. stories and yet we're all telling the same story um and so for, for that it was very much you know we wanted to make sure that we had um you know, that it was watertight and that we had as much evidence as possible. So I spoke to people, you know, whistleblowers and, and people within the mm. industry as well, who kind of backed up the, the models uh, testimonies too, um, and then built a, a, a quite a long, it was a quite a long article in the Guardian that sort of built the case really. Um, but that's not to say that, that the other, that the allegations that had come out previously were, were not, um, you know, e extensive, you know, that they, 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 they were, but, I suppose it's a sign of the, the times as well that there's the mm. people now are more willing to listen to these things. Um, but I mean, it was amazing. I mean, the, the, the 1988 documentaries on CBS with Diane Sawyer that you mentioned. Um, I mean, I think that that was seen by 8 million people in America. Um, and it was largely about uh, Jean-Luc Brunel, who's one of the men who yeah. um, we have a story of in the, in the series. Um, and, and he went on to, he was mainly based in Paris at the time, but he went on to establish an, an agency in America after that. So after it had been seen by, I think 8 million people in America, yeah, yeah. Um, he was still able to go on. So I think it just shows that, and, and I actually spoke to the producer of that, that film and um, he, he's still today, you know, he's gone on to, he's a, a Pulitzer winning journalist and he's gone on to report on many things, but he said it's, it's yeah. still, uh, you know, is a real um, sort of, he's still really angry about, about, wow. about that, you know, that, that he was, he uncovered all this evidence and he did it, you know, particularly in sort of pre-Me Too era, era, he did amazingly to find all that evidence against mm. Brunel and to actually persuade women to go on camera at the time. So these are yeah. models who were modeling at the time, yeah. you know, pre-Me Too, who were going on camera to talk about this, but for some reason, for some reason it didn't resonate. And um, people within the industry saw it, made excuses and, and carried on. I mean, these, these men, were very very powerful at the time and people just didn't people within the industry just didn't want to hmm. it, just, it was easier just to let things carry on as they were hmm. um and and claire so as we were saying earlier then now we've what the, what's powerful about this docuseries on well one one of the many things that's powerful is that like you said in episode three particularly you bring this right up to date and right to now and follow this uh Follow the, uh, the 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 characters, the the survivors, and their and where they're taking this. So, um, I mean, that was all. This is all. It's still live. If our listeners are wondering, we we do have to be. This is an ongoing uh, legal case. Uh, we um, it's there's an investigation going on in France, and we have to be honor that. And so we have to, you know, um, well, not that we're. Uh, mincing words or anything but we do have to be uh you know we're we're being careful that we don't do anything to um to undermine uh certainly those efforts but uh, that it, that must have been a ch challenge for you Claire because this is uh you've got kind of a moving goalpost that you're uh, you're trying to film here well yeah, it, yes it it was and and it wasn't you know when to have something moving you know, means action it's, and it yeah. means drive, it means narrative, yeah. it means story. And so to be able to get to a point after um, decades of, of abuse where it feels like there's, you know, people listening and, the, and, not, and not only people, the justice system listening mm -hmm. finally, 
um, was actually a you know a, a, a huge blessing, um, but the, the sort of the difficulty with it was that yet yeah, the, whilst the judicial system in France had decided that they wanted to hear the testimony of the of the women that we had been filming and and, mm -hmm. and others. It it, it 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 hasn't necessarily moved to a um, investigation. There's no charge as right. yet right. because of the statute of limitations. So the importance of that for us is that you know we we would we would hope to that that there was somebody within the statute of limitations that would come forward. Um, uh, you know, I, you know, on the back of the information that they hear about this series or this stories or mm. wherever you find it to be able to come forward um, with, within a, there's a 30 year limit basically yeah. on any uh, sexual assault or um, a, a, a accusation of rape. Right. So beyond 30 years, they just, they won't hear it. So mm. it, it won't be able to be turned into a, a potential conviction, but, mm. um, but the fact that the French judiciary were, uh, open to hearing the, the, the testimonies, which, you know, which you can tell from the series that over and over again, you mm. hear the same uh, tactics, you hear the same stories, mm. you hear the same familiar kind of uh, uh, lies essentially being told to young mm. girls that it's difficult to discern because of your age and your inexperience in the world. Mm. And, so we 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 yeah we would we would like to think that there would be the, the hope of a of, of a potential prosecution if somebody within the statute of limitations would would, would come forward. And so and so I gather because I it was one question I was going to ask I gather no one who meets that has come forward yet is that right, uh, Carrie? Because Carrie, you're the one that you and the three others you're the you were the first ones to bring the. Uh, case f forward uh, didn't you in 20 was that 2021 yes that is that is correct and even though i had been outspoken and have this all out in my book when the time came to actually give my legal testimony um mm. in paris france it was i i actually thought about it and was like yeah why <laughs> no way yeah. like, nothing's happened yeah. up until this point and do i really want to put myself through that and similarly to the responsibility i felt in writing my book and addressing these issues i realized it was about other survivors it was about other victims and the importance to make that contribution as uncomfortable and exposing as it was mm. um, the importance of in my legacy be doing the right thing and coming forward, not just, you know, for benefit of myself, but for for other survivors and to potentially address the issues in the industry and make the industry a safer place, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Because you would have known that you were outside of the statute of limitations when you when you came forward. But that's but that's the whole point, as you've just said, is to to make to pave the way that others who maybe, well, as you say, uh, to 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 help uh, with the affect change in the industry, but also to make it, make it, it may be easier for someone who, who does, you know, a, one of the survivors in one of those, um, who had within the last 30 years to come forward. And, uh, but yeah. Yeah. when I re also realized that there was none of us that were in the statute of limitations, it became clear that I had a window to file it under the child victim act because I was trafficked through the state of New York. And so mm. I also I also moved forward with that on behalf of other survivors because nobody within my group had had the ability to do that. And, you know, sadly, I was in the right place at the right time at the right age when I was trafficked through New York that I actually was able to go ahead and file charges under under that, the Child Victim Act. And, okay. and it brings the bigger question of statute of limitation reform. And we just had a huge win in the state of New York with the Adult Survivor Act being passed at this point. So that's that's a huge win. And I hope personally that this gets adopted state by state. Okay. I mean, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, it's, um, is this something, I guess that's something you're working on as well, because um, this, I mean, I think, I don't know, it varies by state. I think sometimes these things used to be five, 10 years. Now it's been extended to 30. But do you think there should be any statute of limitations at all? I do not. Yeah. I do not. You know, and what we do know is the trauma and the, 
you know, the lived mm. experience of survivors is that it takes many of us, you know, to be out of the acute trauma and out of childhood to be able to address, you know, what's happened to us. And that is, that's a process that can take yeah. many, many years. And that's sort of shared experience with survivors. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, isn't it, uh, I, I think, who is, is it, is it Jill that is one of the, uh, someone you interview who says she was well into her 50s before she realized exactly what she had really been through? Is that, is, is that right, Claire and, and Lucy? Yeah, J Jill, did, Jill didn't um, realize until Lucy got in touch with her that, um, that there was you know, a, 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 a much that, that she wasn't alone, that she, you know, mm. that 10 years earlier, Shauna had been raped by the same alleged man. And yeah. that, 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 and then not only that, that, that there was a, she, she understood that there had been a transaction involved in, 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 in her, in her meeting with a, another powerful man, but that, that the, 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 the level of sis, the systematic ab abuse within the model industry hadn't really revealed itself to her until, mm -hmm. you know, really until she read Lucy's articles. Hmm. And, I mean, on that, I mean, um, um, I mean, and in those cases, uh, in Lucy's, you've pointed out, and, and um, uh, Carrie's been talking about her own situation, we are talking about, I mean, it's more than just, you know, I, I, it's more than just uh, rape and abuse, but this is this this child this trafficking that's been going on, um, yeah. and that's uh, that's also what is uh, I think. Well, it's it's one of the many shocking things that comes out in this in this in this series. I, I think. Um, I mean, with all that in mind, um, I mean, Carrie, you're with as you mentioned, Model Alliance. Um, what are so what is I mean, besides bringing this case and uh, f having a, fostering a, at the very least a conversation about all this, um, what are you what are you guys trying to do in terms of the industry? What would you like to see um, um, changed? Is it is it is it about regulation? Is it about uh, what are the things that need to to happen? It is about regulation, and it is about. Um, yeah, commitments from, you know, the agents and the power players within the industry to sign up for, say, the RESPECT program um, yeah. and to to create a sort of neutral third party that is mm. the, you know, governing body over what, what are the protocols within this industry and what needs to be created and implemented to um, create safer workplace for, for all of us. It's not just models, it's hairdressers, it's stylists, mm. it's it runs the gamut um, that, you know, across the board, it has been unregulated. And many of us have stories about, you know, lack of financial transparency. I mean, I think throughout my time mm. in Paris, I was never paid. <laughs> you know, I constantly was in debt to my yeah. agency, which is a very typical, you know, ploy to keep somebody, you know, to keep somebody vulnerable and to maintain control. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's what I work on. I'm on the board with the Model Alliance, and and that's what we're working towards. And finally, making enough noise to get an award at the CADA Awards um, and be recognized for our work. So mm. okay. it's an ongoing conversation, and it's going to take a lot of work. And yeah. there are those that are very committed individuals. Okay. And do you think there should be a minimum age for for modeling? I do. Yeah. I do. I, I absolutely do. This is a very grown up world with very grown up issues and any industry um, where one's um, success is based on physicality. I think that's a dangerous game for young people who are still trying yeah. to figure out who they are and define themselves. And Lord knows we don't want anyone to define themselves by, you know, being young, being mm. beautiful, being perfect, these standards that to into this world with all of the technology you know, none of the images out there portray real 
things. They're all, you know, they're, they're all manipulated in some way by some kind of filter. So I know that the youth at this point um, mm-hmm. in, in our life is tremendously ill affected by what's coming up both on social media and ad campaigns and, and mm-hmm. what we see as portrayed, you know, humans, but they're, you know, we're not seeing humanity in, in all of its mm-hmm. diversity. Yes, indeed. Um, I think we're actually coming to the end of our time together. Um, I, I really do appreciate uh, you, you all coming on. I just want to ask uh, sort of maybe one last question or next to last question, if you will. Um, what do you want this? Uh, I'll start with, uh, maybe I'll start with uh, Claire, uh, but we'll go around the, around the screen. Uh, what do you want the legacy of this film to be? I, I would I would love it if off somebody who was in the Statue of Limitations came forward after seeing it and then yeah. was able to put their name down in the, in, in, in the in the in the potential case against Gerald Marie. That would be incredible. Okay. Uh, and Lucy, yeah, I think yeah, likewise as, as Claire said, um, classic. Um, <laughs> like yeah, I think I think um, also just to see. Um, just to see off the back of what Carrie was saying as well, you know, to see sub- substantial change within the industry today um, and, and, and to, to, to generate more of a discussion around this. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fashion industry, the, the, it's never been sort of overhauled. There's never been a, it, it's the same industry that it was then, you know, the, the, the same issues that, that mm. models were facing then still exist today. So to, to be able to kind of create some change around that would be amazing off the back of the series. I mean, what you also, I mean, as just to interject there, you, I mean, it's, it's like, it was like indentured servitude, what I was hearing and seeing in that, in, is in, in all the three episodes, but it, I, I had no clue. I had no clue how bad it was in terms of, uh, I mean, and as you said, every, it wasn't just one person's experience. Everyone had that same experience where they had no money, no way to get home, um, on you know 15 16 17 years old and going through this i i can't i i can't even imagine and carrie what do you want the legacy to be absolutely to provide an opportunity and a safe place for survivors to come forward and certainly mm-hmm. survivor within the statute of limitations um that would be incredible and to really address the systemic toxicity that exists within this industry that I think has been in the dark and avoided and dismissed for so long. And, and this film beautifully pulls all the horrible agonizing pieces together and portrays it finally in a way that's not, you know, ridiculous and people are able to dismiss it. It, it addresses, mm. this film addresses it in a very sober accurate way which is a victory for all of us yeah I, I i agree and actually with that in mind what all of you are saying um if if uh well um if someone might make these uh is been affected by this in terms of this statute of limitations or even if they happen if someone is if, if there's a model out there who has been uh, uh, you know, uh, is a survivor of, of, of such things. They, it, wh- what's the best thing for them to do? Should they reach out to the Model Alliance? What uh, What would you suggest? Personally, I suggest we have a survivor line at the Model okay. Alliance support line, a support line at the Model Alliance, okay. um, and that that is a really great place to start and to access resources. And Lucy, okay. I'm sure you can speak to possibly what's been put together with um, Wonderhood, Guardian, and Sky for reporting. Yes, could you share, uh, uh, Lucy? Um, I, th- I think Wonderhood and Sky are actually talking to Model Alliance um, uh, uh, sort of about partnering. Um, okay. I'm not sure what they, I've, I've been on maternity leave, so I don't actually know what the, the latest for that, <laughs> so, so apologies. Um, but, you know, of course, um, I think, I, I don't, I think that the best way to, um, if there is someone within such of limitations that wants to contribute to the Gerald Marie case, um, I think that, that there are various lawyers now that are representing the, the women who have come forward. So the best way, I, I believe, I mean, I think that Model Alliance, I'm sure, would be able to give some advice on that. Mm. And that might be the best way. But I think, you know, they can go to a lawyer who can then um, submit their testimony Um to the French prosecutor. Um, but, but I mean, of course, you know, I'm, um, 
I, my details are out there on social media and I'm happy to talk to any mm. models that have any, um, you know, have, have had experiences that, that want to tell their story. You know, if, if it is something they want to do, if they want to tell their story in the media, um, that's obviously also an option. But of course, the, you know, the priority, if, if, if mm. there is someone that can contribute to the case, that they, they need to go um, and, and, and give their testimony if, if that's something that they're comfortable with. But if, you know, another option, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to, to investigate the, the fashion industry because I believe that there's a lot more that needs mm. to be told. I mean, this, this series was, um, you know, we, we, we felt, you know, Claire felt that, you know, rightly that it was the best, the, the best way of telling this story was to focus on a small number of women. To, mm. So you can really get to know the, the key issues, but, but whilst they're telling a much bigger story, but, there are other perpetrators. There are many other victims, other survivors. Yeah. Um, and so I, I intend to, con- to continue telling this story um, and uh, continue reporting on it. So, um, yeah, there's an option there if, if people do want to get in touch with me. Okay. All right. Well, th- well, thank you. Thank you for all reporting on this story. And thank you, all of you, for uh, for coming on to, to the podcast. And uh, it's very much appreciated. I uh, really, really, I highly recommend... Uh, uh, our listeners, you do check this out. Scouting for Girls, Fashion's Darkest Secrets. It's coming to Sky Documentaries on June 6th. And just to remind you, we've been speaking with Claire Richards, Lucy Osborne, and Carrie Otis. And it's been a, a pleasure. And uh, thank you so much. And I wish you all well and best of luck uh, in, in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. All right. No, thank you. Anyway. Thank you for watching the series. Another big thank you to series director Claire Richards, senior producer Lucy Osborne, and fashion model, activist, and contributor to the film, Carrie Otis. We're talking about Scouting for Girls, Fashion's Darkest Secrets, a docuseries that's coming to Sky Docs on June 24th. So as as you've just been listening, we are, besides dealing with some very uh, um, difficult and troubling issues, these are, they're... um, there is a legal case involved here, and uh, so it's only appropriate that we have to um, that we actually share some further information. Um, most notably, that uh, a lawyer for uh, Gerald Marie um, has stated that he quote firmly object, objects unquote to the quote false allegations made against him close quote. Uh, His lawyer added, uh, quote, he remains calm and refuses to participate in the fallacious and dishonest media controversy that has been fomented more than 30 years later. He is withholding his statements for the justice system in which he has complete faith, close quotes. Gerard Marie remains under police investigation in France and is presumed innocent. John Casablancas retired to Brazil in the early 2000s with the young wife he met at a Look of the Year contest, and he died in 2013. In 2004, Elite was forced into bankruptcy and the brand was sold. The current owners have no connection with the prior management and have strongly condemned the historic allegations of abuse. They are committed to a culture of respect, empowerment, and protecting the safety of their models. Claude Haddad, who's also mentioned in the docuseries, died in 2009. He previously denied allegations of sexual misconduct against him. Another person or man profiled in the docuseries is Jean-Luc Brunel, who declined to comment on the allegations made against him in this film when he was still alive. He had previously strongly denied all the allegations against him. Brunel's former modeling agency, Karen's, is now under new management. And prior to his death in February 2022, Jean-Luc Brunel declined requests to participate in the series or respond to its allegations. I'd like to give a shout out to Sam and Joe Graves at Intersound Audio in Eskrick, England in deepest, darkest Yorkshire. A big thanks to Nevin Apanovich, podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show. And finally, a big thanks to our listeners. As always, we love to hear from you, so please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas. You can reach out to us on YouTube, social media, or directly by going to our website, www.factualamerica.com, and clicking on the Get In Touch link. And as always, please remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. 
This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.